Oh God, what we do this morning is what we hope to do every time we gather at this time of the week. It's for a time of learning, for a time of being together. And we pray, God, not just for uh, learning for learning's sake, as in to seek knowledge, as wonderful as that is. We, we're looking for applied knowledge. Um, so uh, a sense of reflective learning where it goes uh, from head to heart and then into our life. And so ha however that needs to take place, if it comes directly from the text, then uh, we want to pray for that. If it comes from looking at the text and then conversations around it, then, then we pray for that. Or if it comes just in the pondering of, of thoughts and ideas in the uh, hours and days to come after today, uh, this meeting, then, oh God, we pray for that as well. Uh, you're also, um, oh Lord, as we gather, uh, aware of the many concerns that have been mentioned. Uh, we know that these are just the tip of the iceberg, that if we were to take time and to go through every concern um, and every burden, whether the burdens that we carry that uh, out of sadness and grief and concern or the, the burdens that we carry that, that end up leading to joy. Uh, in, in all of these, uh, we want to be mindful of them. And if there's a way of uh, exchanging those, um, uh, laying those before your feet, um, and then to take up your yoke, oh God, uh, we pray for that. And we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, uh, we're in the... Saturday? Did you say Saturday? All right. Okay. Yeah, so not this coming Saturday, but Saturday week. Right. Okay. And while, while we're giving announcements, uh, you might want to pray for the greenhouse because this Thursday, Auburn plays Kentucky. And Brooke graduated from Kentucky, so we'll have a little bit of a split. Uh, and um, hopefully that won't lead to, to arguments. Uh, as long as Auburn wins, we'll be okay. But if we don't, then you might want to pray for her. Uh, some of you that are uh, um, Facebook friends with her, um, the, the last time Auburn lost, which you pick any game, it seems to be this year, uh, there were people that were talking back and forth. And uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't on Facebook. It was in a text, like a group text. And she said uh, they were all making fun of Auburn, which was trying to throw jabs at me, and to which she said, y'all don't realize that I have to live with this guy. So if it's just remotely close, that's okay. And so uh, anyways, all right, enough commentary about football. Uh, we're in the fifth ascent, and it's a very long one uh, in when it just comes for uh, Scripture in general. And at, at least for the book of Exodus, it takes up, uh, I mean, what, maybe – six or seven chapters or so, and a lot of description about what's going on. Now, the, one of the handouts that I gave you, I'm going to borrow this one. This handout that, that looks like this, hopefully that's going around. And, uh, okay, uh, do we have excess anywhere? Coming on up, all right. Um, it's all of this that I wrote down, so... Uh, um, if you wanted, some of you have copied that, and uh, obviously we know real quick those that, that ruined the bell curve for everybody else growing up, that would be those that have already copied it, uh, so thanks a lot, and, uh, but uh, it might be, I, I printed it off because I think in, in, from the back it's harder to see, but that's, a, that's a, a, a breakdown of what's going on, and at some level when you read this, well let me ask this, what was your first thoughts just in reading it? 
Yeah, details, details, details. And uh, someone like me getting bogged down in all this, you know, it's like plowing through the mud. And, uh, but on a different level, um, there's, a, there's a reason why. And uh, what, we, what we discover when we read this is that, uh, you know, God has made covenant with them. God has given them insight into his nature, given them insight into uh, what it means to be a part of this covenant. And so the next logical question, and, and by covenant we mean God's going God, to be near to them, going to be in their presence. So the next logical question is, how then do we approach this God? And this is the answer. And, uh, and the reason why it's so detailed and, and full of prescription is to give insight into how, how do people live with a holy God who dwells in their presence? And how do they approach this God? Uh, and on another level, um, you, you, me, people in general will take care of the things that they love and so you see God taking care of his people by giving them a way to approach God without getting in trouble. And at the same time, the people's care uh, of the things of God uh, is an indication of, uh, of the children of Israel caring for the God that they love as well. And so th there's a reason why it goes to great detail and, and so much prescription uh, into what to do, how to do it, how, you know, and and all down the line, it's to, uh, it's to give insight to how do you approach this God it, it, for, for these people. And um, what we also find in this that I think is just really interesting, there, there are, um, you know, when we, when we looked at the Ten Commandments in the Fourth Ascent, that, uh, they're really words that are given. These are the ten words that are given to them. Uh, and and we, we call them commandments. Um, uh, you have five words. You have that same theme going along now in this fifth ascent. There are five major words. And what I mean by words, Moses is hearing God speaking. And so that's, that's why we, we call these words. Uh, 25 1. 25. Uh, so I'm having to be the first where, where we find God speaking. Uh, 30 11. 30 17. 3022, 3034, 311, and 3112. And, and, and those will follow some of the, uh, the guidelines of, or the subject matters of what's going on uh, inside of this fifth ascent. Um, what's interesting here, too, is that the ark now becomes the center. Of, of God's presence, or at least the, the center of the dwelling place. Uh, and, and what we discover just in general thoughts from looking at this passage is that the Lord reveals uh, His purpose, which, uh, and maybe even what would have been maybe a secret purpose or an underlying purpose uh, for delivering the, the, the children of Israel, uh, and, and it's the idea of a sanctuary for His dwelling an actual place to come and dwell. And we have that being fleshed out here for the first time. Uh, so a, a number of different uh, insights coming into this uh, that we have. And, um, and so uh, any other just general comments that from your reading or studying of the passage outside of details uh, that, that just caught you uh, from last week? Yeah, quality of the material. It's not, uh, yes, it is. And it's uh, uh, um, the quality of the material, um, the exact nature of what to, you know, what to do with it, how to, who to do it, and or to make it. Right, right, right. Right, exactly right. So and it's not uh, outside of Moses and Aaron the only other people that are named in this segment are the craftsmen, correct? I mean, there's, no, there's not just a, a listing of a thousand different names. You got Moses, you got Aaron. I mean, Aaron's ch descendants are just known, they're known through Aaron, Aaron's sons. Uh, but when we get into uh, the part where we start uh, making, making some of the, the temple 
uh, specifications, you actually have other people being introduced into, into the text uh, and for a purpose. Now, I'll tip my hand, but you know, we're, we'll jump ahead. Only one of them is listed as having the Spirit of God descending or dwelling. The other one is just listed as in one of great skill, which is interesting. So uh, um, we, we can get when we get to that, we can we can talk about it. So anything else, just general comments that show up that uh, or um, that just kind of struck you when you were looking at this in general. But we have, you know, you have a uh, you have. Um, I mean, you've got the idea of the physical aspects of it or the, the, the uh, as in the things or the building or whatever you want to talk about uh, and, and great care of what they're supposed to, what they, what they are, how to build them and what their purpose. Uh, but then you have a, then you move into um, not just uh, the actual things, but you move into who's going to, who does, who's going to do what. And uh, um, a great deal into the whole concept of the priest and their dress and, and, uh, and then how both of them together, what the, how that functions. Uh, so interesting, interesting piece of, uh, of the book of Exodus here in this fifth ascent. So let's dive into it and we'll make some comments about just the... the uh, just the, that stand out to be a little bit more than just the general, you know, take this, make, you know, four ring holes with this wood. You know, we'll, we'll see if we can pull out some of the things that, uh, that stand out that might, be, uh, that might be very beneficial for us. So the first thing that we have uh, in, in chapter 24, obviously you have the covenant confirmed in the beginning, and then we get into, uh, in verse 12, we pick up part of this, uh, this fifth ascent. And, um, uh, and so we have th this God who comes alongside and, and God's presence is, is very near uh, and it'll be a constant uh, for them. And uh, so when we look at this in general, we see a God who comes and God's going to give them insight into what it means uh, or how to approach him. Uh, in, in just the daily living or, or the daily walking with this God. And uh, what's interesting in, in chapter 25, when we start getting into the, uh, the, some of the things and where, uh, at least where God talks about a sanctuary, 25 chapter 8, I mean 25 verse 8. I'll give you a second to find that. Um, uh, it says, and let them make me a sanctuary does anybody have a different word other than sanctuary sacred residence. all right sacred residence Any, anything else other than sanctuary or sacred uh, resident what bible do you have sue uh, it's the, um, living a new, a new living living yeah um, um, th but that's that's a pretty good translation there the what what we have is um uh, this, it is this idea of uh, um, sanctuary as in um, a place that is holy. Uh, the, the, the noun there that is used actually means place of holiness for sanctuary. And so to have sacred residence is, is picking, on, picking up the actual name of it. You know, uh, tabernacle, um, the word that is used uh, uh, also in 25.9 um, which is exactly as, it, as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and its furniture, uh, so, you, uh, so you shall make it. Tabernacle uh, comes from the idea to, to dwell, uh, and, or maybe the, the common uh, word that would be used often is tent. And so uh, to use the word sanctuary sets this apart as, as being not just the run-of-the-mill tent. I mean, now they're living in tents, remember? And, and God's going to dwell among them. And in, in theory, the, uh, the tabernacle itself, when we, if you look at the other sheet that I passed out, it looks like just a giant tent with, all, with other tents inside of it. Uh, but 
it's it's more than just a, a tent. It's a sacred residence. I think that's what you said, Sue. Or or it's a sanctuary. It's a place of holiness uh, to where God is is to dwell. Uh, so just in general, looking at this, when when God is introducing this to Moses, um, you know, obviously, Becky, you're right to to talk about all the details and and all the finest of. Uh, either garments or wood or or stones things of that nature all of it is to uh is to give understanding behind this sacred residence uh this holy place that uh where God's going to dwell and uh i mean it's not it's not of the run of the mill um and the reason why is because it's God's dwelling place uh and it's more than just the the average tent uh, this is something where that will honor God in a place that is fitting for God, um, which is interesting if you think about it. Uh, now, if you contrast that, uh, or if, if, you know, then we can go forward to the temple. So think about your Old Testament understanding when the temple is built under Solomon. Uh, you know, if you think this has description, you can go forward into you know, the historical parts, the Chronicles, the Samuels uh, of the Old Testament. And uh, when Solomon is given the directions to build a temple, it makes this just look like, you know, color by numbers. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, it's really, really elaborate and a great deal goes on for, you know, about uh, chapter and chapter and chapter of what's supposed to take place inside of that. Uh, so we have a couple of places in the Old Testament here being the first one, the temple being the second one, as being a residence for God. And, and there, there's great detail that goes into that for that purpose. Now, in the New Testament, obviously the seat of the dwelling place uh, changes. It becomes what? Right, it becomes the person uh, inside of uh, Corinthians. There's two times in Corinthians where it says you are... Uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we could use that word sanctuary and, and to, to use that language, the, uh, a, a sacred residence of the Holy Spirit. One time it's used in the plural, which means you as in all of us, y'all. That's, you know, Paul's a southerner. This is y'all are the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the other time it's used in the singular, you personally, as in an individual also. Um, so... God goes to great care to give insight into Moses of how to build the tabernacle. God goes to great care and, in, and get to give insight to Solomon to build the temple. In the New Testament, if we together are the temple, uh, you know, can, is there, do we go to great care to care for us? You, you understand where I'm going with that? And so... What's that? Are you talking care for us physically? Well, both. I mean, if the New Testament understanding of, of temple is plural and singular, I'm going to erase this. Y'all don't need this, do you? Okay. Um, uh, I mean, think about it. If there's only a couple times where it talks about a dwelling place for God, okay? There's, there's here, first time. I mean, outside of the heavens, okay? And so, uh, but, but in, in, in the Bible, there's not... A, a ton of different verses or, or chapters or diff different parts of the Bible that go into to detail about God's dwelling place. I mean, obviously you got this one here. You got in, in the historicals about with Solomon, the temple, and then uh, uh, what we have, the veil being torn, uh, if, you, if you go into the Gospels, and then you have Paul uh, you know, moving forward to say, you are the temple, you plural, or you individual. If God... If, if it's important for God that he gives so much detail in both places, and then we may move into our own life here now, if we are the, the dwelling place for God, you know, do we go to that same care for either me or you as an individual or for us together? No, we don't. No, we don't. I mean, you know, and so there's a why. Uh, you know, if, if uh, I'm just asking the question, if God, I mean, think about what is this, seven, eight chapters? 
And it's not just go pick anybody that's, you know, go pick the guy that's just sitting by the water hole, let him build the stuff. I mean, it's no, it's, it's fairly detailed. Pick this person for this purpose to do it this way. Same thing with Solomon. Then when we get to us, uh, you know, do we go to that same level of care for the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit today? And if not, why? Uh, I mean, that's a question that I think we all need to wrestle. We don't have to come up with an answer with it. I mean, I, um, but it, it's at least, uh, you know, it's a sobering question to ask. And, uh, you know, now we can say, okay, the church, we go to great care to care for the church, the building. But, you know, if the theological shift from tabernacle to temple, to temple, then to heart, singular and plural, uh, you know, do we, do we go to great care to, to, to oversee that, to be a trustees for it? And uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, if we want to stay on the physical, do we go to the same level to, to care for the church, the building? You know, uh, I think that's a derivative of it. I mean, I, I like, I mean, I think to, to stay just on the physical realm of tabernacle, temple, and then to church building misses the theological shift that takes place in the New Testament. Um, but either one, you know, do, you, do, you, do we see that in the same way? Do we approach it the same way? If the underlying current to why the fifth descent is here is to give insight into how do we approach God. And so it's serious too. Very detailed. Uh, the best of quality. Do we, do we make the same jump inside of our own life? You know, I, I would, you know, I'd probably no. Sure. Well, okay, it could be. I mean, that's what that happens in the old. Te the question or the comment was, we take it for granted, and and that's a that's I think that's a fair assumption, because in the you know uh, eventually the children of Israel will take this for granted, and then eventually after Solomon, the people and the kings will take it for granted, and so uh, I mean I think there's I think that's a fair assessment, um, but it's not. It's not enough of a justification to say, well, you know how it is, God. It's all right. You know, uh, all y'all that copied this and messed up the bell curve, you know, we believe God grades on the curve anyways, right? So, I mean, you know, thanks a lot for blowing it all for us, you know. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's still something to think about. Um, uh, I mean, at least in, in you know, one of, the, one of the things in studying this this week uh, or, you know, from one from Tuesday to Tuesday is, you know, wow, God, you go to great length to describe pretty much uh, not everything. We don't have everything that was in there. Like some, th uh, some of the passages, he'll say, make this. Well, you know, we don't, he doesn't tell us how long it is, if it's 12 inches or 18 inches or whatever. I mean, so some of it was entrusted just to that original audience, but there's still a lot of description. And it's for the, the, the magnitude of who's going to dwell there, and uh, you know, I just I was just struck by wow, you know, God, I don't even go to that great care for my own self, and surely don't go to that great care for for other things that I would say belong to you. Uh, so, sure. Right. 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 Build the chapel or study the chapel? <laughs> the chapel right, right. You said we almost need to do it again. Build it again or study no. it again? <laughs> study it. Okay, all right. I just, I just want to make sure I was on the same page. I was like, well, and I'm not sure that would work out good if we tried to build it again, you know. So, uh, well, you know, and for those that study abroad and you go to those, you go to cathedrals that were built, you know, uh, hundreds if not thousands of years ago, and you see the the level of approach to an altar or to a chair or, or something like that, you know, what you have is, I mean, you see some insight into that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I guess we have to ask uh, inside of our own culture where uh, the, pre I'm going to use the phrase preservation of, of institution, okay? Uh, we're at a period of time where we've, the 
pendulum swing, we've, we've swung away from that. And, for, and there's some good reasons behind that. I mean, we can get caught up in what should be a means to an end. You know, the, the means becomes the most important thing uh, as, as compared to something else. Um, and so there's a reason why on some level inside of religious culture and in culture in general, we've swung to, the pendulum swung to the other side. But there's a cost to it. And the cost is that, you know, what we miss. And so I don't, I, you know, I don't, at some point as a religious society, or, and I'm speaking inside the church, a religious group, the church, whatever terms you want to use, we've got to find a happy medium where, where there's, a, there's care for what belongs to God, uh, even in the things of it, uh, and, and at the same time to not get caught up to where that is the end itself instead of what this was supposed to be. I mean, the tabernacle, as wonderful as it is, is, is the dwelling place for God, but it is not God. Okay? I mean, you know, and so there's, there's a sense of where at some point, you know, and each culture has to wrestle with that, and, and you know, this is, our, this is our homework today. Where is that happy medium that, that becomes, that, that uh, cares for it and treats it for what it is, uh, but at the same time, doesn't allow that to become the God itself, you know. Uh, and, and that happens in churches. I mean, the carpet can become the God. I mean, I'm, you know, um, I'm just telling you it is. I mean, you know, uh, if we build a building program, you'll see it. I mean, uh, uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah, exactly right, you know. And so, uh, you know, it's amazing uh, how, how that happens. And uh, so, anyways, I, I, I don't want to stay on that forever, but it is worth, uh, right. Or, or other places. Yes. Right. 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 Three hundreds, and the reason why is because in the three hundreds, uh, three hundred and maybe oh five A.D. or somewhere in that neighborhood, Christianity gets favored status. They couldn't build before. Because they, the Romans wouldn't let them, and right, exactly right. And so uh, the Romans had an approved. I forgot the, some Latin phrase for the approved religions, and Christianity was not approved. And so they could not build, even if they wanted to. They get favorite. They get on the list around 305, 320 ish, 320 somewhere in that neighborhood. They actually become the number one favorite via Constantine. Well, immediately there's building programs all over Christianity. And uh, so the cathedrals start, you know, really starting to roll out 350, 390, 400, all that. Uh, and because what you have too, if you think about it in Acts, um, in, in, all right, Gospels, think about the theology that shows up in, inside the New Testament. Gospels give you insight into Jesus Christ, uh, person, uh, work, king, uh, priest, death, resurrection, you get all, all that in the Gospels. And so immediately you move into the Acts, which is then the, the giving of the task of ministry to the disciples and to the early Christians. Well, you know, after Acts, uh, you start going into a number of different directions, all seen as missional work, right? But all of this is Christianity is an overwhelming minority with people. And so they don't get a majority status until 300 years or 250 years later, 270 years later after, after Christ. And so if you think about the logic of the movement of the church, you go from uh, creation with Jesus to mission at some point, logically, you can't stay in a missional status forever. 
No organization stays in a missional status forever. At some point, you get large to where you have to then create organization. I mean, there's, what, there's no group, whether it be business, whether it be a creation of countries, whatever you want to call it. At some point, you get to where there's the masses. Even here, chapter 18 in Exodus, what do we have? We have the formation of at least some structure. Jethro goes to Moses and says what? It's too large. You're going to kill yourself. One person cannot, cannot do all this. And so you have, the, you have the, the, the elders or the judges later on when in, inside of this, um, this part here uh, that we're looking at this, this, uh, today. Moses goes up. Aaron goes up. He brings his sons. Who else does he bring? The elders. They're the leaders. Well, where'd they come from? Chapter 18. Uh, you know, and then, then so you have, you have at some point, and I don't, you know, uh, there has to be some level of structure. Now, there's, you know, uh, there's to some degree we don't like that because then we feel like we're losing the missional aspect. We, not necessarily. That's the struggle, what I meant by, at, you know, where what is a means for something, the means to the end is create structure so that the masses can find God, all right? You, are you with me? And so, you know, but unfortunately what happens is that the end becomes the means. That's the negative of an institution or, or an organization, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it happens in churches, it happens in business, it happens in, in anything that you want to look at it from an organizational aspect or structure. Uh, and so, but without it, what happens? You blow up. You fight. Revolution. I mean, you know, who, uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians. Well, Becky, I'm sorry, you didn't come to St. Paul under my ministry and, and you know so you came under so and so's ministry and you came over this person's ministry and, and so you've got your part and you've got your part and I've got my part and then we're all vying for leadership. Who's who's gonna be at the top? And, you know I mean and, and they blowing up the church. And so uh, part of what Paul gives in First Corinthians is is giving some structure to their life. Uh, not taking what was Taking, you know, they, they're focusing in on some of the means as the end, and Paul wants to take them off that and put it back on the right end, which is, you know, don't forget that all of you are in Christ. And because you're in Christ, you know, this is always the end. And I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it, it, every church in some form or fashion has whether it be on a local church, on a denomination, or the church in general. doesn't matter how large or how small you want to get. At some point, it goes from here to here. Uh, and, and this is, it's scary because it'll, you, can, you can throw out some, I mean, you get in trouble with some things where, where, where the, the end no longer is the end. Uh, the means becomes the end. But, you know, without it, uh, I'm not sure you survive. I mean, just on a practical level. And so, uh, um, so the formation of the churches, uh, you know, you have that growing. Uh, for, I mean, when, when Constantine takes the lid off, for lack of better words, people flock to the church. And so what happens if, and we'll take St. Paul, for instance, what happened, or whatever church you're part of, I know some uh, 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 are involved in other churches, what do you do if a thousand people showed up tomorrow? Or you say, yay, okay. Like, then the week after that, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, if you don't, you, you, you'll have the biggest front door and the biggest back door there is. And, you know, and uh, I mean, you got you to come up with some level of infrastructure on how to work. And so this is what, you know, part of this is infrastructure. I'm coming, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you how to approach me. I mean, do you see the logic inside the book of Exodus? 
I'm, I, I hear it. You're my people. I hear you. I'm going to deliver you. We're walking. I'm going to give you structure, how to be with me, how, to know what it means to be a part of the covenant. And it's not just grand, big picture, big commandments, but I'm going to, I'm going to flesh them out even more. And I'm going to give you a means to approach me and to interact with me. All of this, I mean, this, this, you can see the progression inside the book of Exodus. Uh, so, I mean, and you can see God's desire of, you know, if we just looked at maybe chapter 2 and say, okay, God hears, God sees, God remembers, and God's going to act. And then we turn to chapter 4 and he says, okay, there, there they go. Well, wait, I mean, is that how it works? I mean, there's no way. There'd be people being left behind. And then even then, how do you, how do you even... How do you approach God? If God is going to be amongst the people, well, what if you touch the mountain before Moses did? It's like the, uh, you remember when, uh, when I was little, when we used to go up to the lake, you had those bug, bug zappers, you know? <laughs> no, they're gone, you know? I mean, it's kind of what it'd be like. The mountain's the bug zapper, you know? And uh, if you, so, uh, I mean, there's, this is, you can see what God is establishing here. And it's, it is detailed, and, and it's, uh, it requires a lot of work, uh, but it's for the purpose of dwelling with this God in covenant and how we approach Him. All right? Um, so we have the formation of this holy place, this sacred place. Uh, also, when we get into 25, if you look in verse 17, you see some purpose behind it. Uh, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, um, mercy seat that uh, kaporeth is the Hebrew word um, and where you get the idea of Yom Kippur, uh, kaporeth, uh, and it, it means to cover. And so you have 20, still in 25, 20, 25, 17. We just, um, the first part of 25 deals with uh, the sanctuary and then the next, that's from verses 1 Twenty-five one to twenty-five nine, but then when we get into verse ten, it starts a, a you know a new topic of of this temple furni- oh, I erased it where it said temple furnishings, and we have the the formation of an ark, and then in in verse seventeen uh, you have the formation of a mercy seat, uh, and you got great detail into what the mer- mercy sheet mercy seat shall look like, and and what you know what. You know, how big it's going to be, what type of material is going to be used to make it. But then look at verse 21. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I give you, the Ten Commandments. Uh, and I will meet with you uh, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim. So you have both of these being put together. But the word there for mercy seat actually uh, is to to make atonement. It comes from the Hebrew word that has to deal with atonement or to cover. Uh, and oh, okay, good. All right. All right, perfect. And uh, so, um, again, y'all, you have Living Bible. Okay, what you have? Just a black one? I mean, that's what I... <laughs> All right, NIV, yeah, NIV, okay, good. NIV does real good with uh, word translation, that's, that's, a, so that's good. But the idea is to cover, uh, and this is going to be where God comes and meets with the priest and speaks to the priest. Um, so you start to see the, the theology behind it. Um, then in verse 23, we, we make a table, uh, which is interesting there. Uh, just no purpose other than the fact that I think it's interesting that Pretty close to the ark is a table, and it's going to hold bread. And um, when we get into verse 31, we have these lampstands. And, uh, you know, actually the first duty of the priest is to do what? We haven't gotten to the priest. That's exactly right, to tend to the lampstands, and uh, which is... Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so... Uh, Sure, sure. You know, in Hezekiah, when you go into the kings, uh, one, uh, what, oh, I'm, I'm going to kick myself or not remember this, but one of the foreigners, foreign kings, comes over, I think, to Hezekiah, 
and he's showing off all the gold uh, inside the temple to the foreign king. Well, the foreign king goes back and says, we've got to invade this place. You know what I mean? And that's exactly what happens. Like a year later, they're at war. And so, you know, note to self, you know, don't, uh, that's exactly right. I mean, don't, don't show all the shields and everything else you got in there. You know, um, you know uh, when's the last time that you have somebody tending to uh, a constant burning in Exodus? burning bush and the lampstands are to burn all the time and and you have the idea of fire uh you know fire as being one of the symbols to give uh to to signify god's presence and here you have a a constant burning fire and yet not consumed similar to the burning bush right right i mean the oil all that it ties into that that this level of imagery um, in, as in song, you know, and so, uh, but what you have is you have, again, God going to great detail, uh, to, to make, you know, then to make the tabernacle, we get into verse 20, I mean, chapter 26, we're going to take a break in about five minutes. And, um, and the tabernacle itself really is just a bunch of tents that are, you know, small tent, uh, you know, then a little bit larger tent, a little bit larger tent, a little bit larger tent, uh, and they're laid up. Uh, you, you know, um, part of what I gave you in this, you can see the, uh, you can see the, how the tents on the outside, uh, and you can see them in color a little bit. Sorry, Ann, you're not going to be able to see this, but uh, just the different tents on top of each other. And um, so you can get a little bit of insight of what it was supposed to, you know, what it's supposed to look like uh, from the ark. And then you've got the, uh, if you look at the ark, which is on the far left side, and it would be separated by that purple tent. Uh, and then, then you have, if you go on the other side of the purple tent, the first thing you see uh, is, uh, I mean, the, the, the thing to the right is the table. And obviously it looks like it has loaves of breads on it right across. What is that made out of? What kind of wood? Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's wood that's in that area that would have been very, uh, uh, I mean, it has been all over the place. It's like cedar. Yeah, it is. It's like cedar. I mean, uh, as in the type of wood, but it grows in that area. And uh, it was not a pine tree. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, um, real high, real strong, high quality wood. Um, and, uh, but you see where... I mean, the picture gives you some insight into all this that they're given description to. Uh, lay, lay on top of each other, yeah, and right, right. Well, see how, um, yeah. I mean, if you see how on the outside here, you got these are like different levels of tent. Like one of them's goat hair, one of them is. Uh, it, it'll give you description, um, but they're just laid on top of each other. It's like you know, three or four different tents laid on top of each other. Now, when we get to the temple, uh, when the formation of the temple is built, this this becomes the the holy of holies, what you got here, and the the tents are the tents are elongated to become courts. Okay, and so if you got the holy of holies. Now, which is what you that now the tabernacle, what you are inside this little piece right here, right here, where you have the ark and then you have the the table and and you have the coals and all that and you have the lampstand, that becomes the holy of holies uh, inside the temple, and then and only the high priest could go in here one time a year, and uh, and then you have a larger area that becomes the court of the priest. So obviously, you know, uh, the priest in general could come uh, into that. And then you have a little bit bigger area, and that's the court of the men or the, the Israelites. Uh, and then you have a larger area after that called the court of the women. And then you have uh, just an area that's like just for the, anybody. Stick, stick on the altar where they burn the... Yeah, that's all, that's all in here. Mm -hmm. All in here. And then in... Uh, you have like the, uh, and also in this you have like the bronze altar in 27. 
You also have a gold altar. Uh, you see how um, they're outside of the Holy of Holies. They take different, there are different areas in the temple uh, when the temple's built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, um, it is, yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> the what now? Yeah, uh, well, it still is. I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it, those, that hadn't changed. And, uh, but in, in, this would be what the temple would look like years later, but it's based off of this. Uh, you know, or it's based off the, the tabernacle. Yeah, a little bell in case he falls out, and uh, yeah, and they pull him out. Well, you know, uh, that probably showed up under. I mean, is that? I have to go and investigate the text. Uh, is it? Because um, it shows up in Leviticus. I wonder if that's something that they discovered in what I would call case law. Shane, the high priest, goes in. He does it wrong. And Shane doesn't have a belt or a rope around his leg. And, you know, days later, Shane hadn't come out yet. You know, and it's like, okay, note to self, the next time somebody goes in, we got to have a way to retrieve this guy. You know, so. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, the, um, it, he consumed. Consumed, yes. Uh, well, no, it's uh, the prescription is more when. You know, uh, when, we, when we come back after break, we're going to talk about the priests. And you, I want us to spend a little bit of time there. You have great detail into what, who the priests are and what they do. And the same thing would apply later on uh, when um, you have just a general mention that once a year Aaron will go in to, to make offering there. Uh, but that gets, when you get into Leviticus, that gets explained out even more and the details around that. Uh, and so the idea is first, uh, the priest would go in and make atonement for himself. And then, or he'd make atonement for himself. Then he would go and make atonement for the people. Well, you know, if he didn't follow the prescription right, I mean, you know, it's, there's a reason why it's there. And so the idea was to pull him out. If the bell stopped ringing, he, he probably stopped. I mean, you know, so, uh, so, um, but you have, you know, uh, but what we have is, you know, great detail as outlined into, you know, what's going on. You've got sanctuary, you've got ark, you've got um, table, you've got the lampstands, and all of them have a function to them, but there's also a theological purpose behind it. Uh, you know, even... Even the tabernacle itself, that, that's getting into the, the, you know, the outer shell of it. Uh, and then when we get in, 27 is what happens when we leave the tabernacle inside the court area. Well, you have, a, you have an altar, and, and the altar is for specific purpose as well. Um, and so, uh, uh, and then when we get into 28, and we're going we're gonna to do that right after the break, you have, uh, you have, okay, now that everything's been built, or at least they are, all the directions have been given, now who's going to who's going to take care of it? Who who's going to who's going to work it? Uh, so let's take a break uh, for about uh, ten minutes, and then we'll pick back up.
Well, welcome back. And a um, uh, couple of things to, to look at now is, that, you know, we've just touched on a few of the things that are in the text that have to deal with the actual tabernacle itself as in the building or the physical things. Now, uh, inside this fifth ascent, we then move, or, or at least the, the topic moves from who, who then will, uh, will be the officiants, who will, who will take care of that, who will work all the things that are going to be built. And, uh, and so we have, we, have the, we have the priest. And uh, um, the, the actual rest of the, um, the rest of this portion of Scripture follows this type of breakdown uh, where there's a great deal of, of priestly insight. Some of it is their function. Some of it is how they dress. Um, you know, my first impression of this part of the Scripture, just going into the, uh, how elaborate the dress is, uh, you know, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, that, to me, almost seems like overkill, doesn't it? Uh, it's expensive, yeah, exactly right, you know, so, uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to change the St. Paul worship budget, and uh, we're going to reenact this, and uh, so I'll, I'll put on, you know, uh, no, not hardly, uh, could you imagine how heavy it would be, and, uh, um, but, but it's, it's interesting that we have all this information, uh, um, right, right, and, and all the, all the different, uh, the different stones and and you know the different layers. Um, obviously, this is not in the south. Uh, could you imagine how hot it would be? Uh, what's that? Well, it is. That's exactly right. It's in the desert. Yeah. So I guess it's even worse. Well, I won't complain anymore then, when it's uh, you know. Uh, are the priests elected? No. It's a it's it's a divine appointment, not popular election, uh, which is interesting, and uh, uh, but you, that's that right off the very beginning. That's what we discover, uh, verse twenty. I mean, chapter twenty-eight. Then bring to new, bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, uh, which is you know. Then you've got a list of some other names as well. Uh, so I misspoke earlier. I thought I forgot that they were listed. So we have the priest, have his sons, and then we have a few of the priests listed, and then uh, you have the the, the craftsmen. Uh, their their names are listed. Um, and so we have first. You know what's interesting to me is there's not a lot of discussion around the qualifications of a priest, other than the fact that they're descendants of Aaron. But there's a great deal of discussion about what they wear. Uh, I mean, is that, I mean, think why? I mean, is that just, uh, um, well, I, 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 as if God is saying, I've appointed them, so we're not going to get into who's going to do it and who's not. That question's already, you know, let's just go ahead and get that thing, you know, established right off the bat. So now let's get on with the other stuff. Is it that, or is there something to the clothing that makes, that will... Uh, I don't want to use the word purify, but will will uh, will will qualify the person. <laughs> yeah, long memory, right? But I mean, but there's a great deal about what they wear, how they wear it, uh, and and to some degree why they wear it. Does the clothing qualify the person, or? Is it just God has settled it from the very beginning that it's just going to be Aaron and his descendants? I'm asking. I, I mean, I, you know, which one? I mean, uh, it's just Aaron. Yeah, it's just God's. Okay, all right. So, uh, uh, well, then why go to such great detail with the clothing? Right. Hang on. Um, uh, could be. I mean, we don't get a lot. The only thing that shows up in perpetuity is that it's the... The, 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 right, the line. Hang on, Pat, Patty, Patty had a hand up. Right. Sure. Well, 
Well, it, it could be, uh, it could be, you know, that it's similar in line with all the the tabernacle furniture and whatnot. I mean, it's of such high quality. Would you know? Would we expect anything less from the people who are who are working that? Okay. I mean, I, I'm not trying to point you in any direction. I'm just asking questions of the text. You know that. Uh, is it just right off the bat? The first, I mean, you know, when we move to the subject of the priest, you know, the very first verse is, I've determined, as if, not I, but God saying to Moses, I've determined who the priest is going to be. As if to shut the door, as if to say, there's no more discussion around this. It's not going to be an election. So let's just get on with the subject matter. Uh, Doesn't that also go to, you know, we are also priests. Right. 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 Sure. Well, no, there, there. Uh, obviously, you can make the jumps uh, into the New Testament. I think uh, from the Book of Exodus, there are so many theological uh, comparisons to the New Testament that are are not forcing it on the text, and so. Uh, I mean, all those, I mean, I'm not disagreeing. I think, I'm just asking the question, uh, you know, d- does, uh, is it divine appointment or is there something about either in in the function of their role or, you know, the clothing itself that helps, you know, the, those that don it, they are qualified. I'm just asking what qualifies them. Is it God that qualifies them or is it, you know, they're qualified as they work. Uh, go ahead. Mine says making special clothing for Aaron to show his separation to God. Beautiful garments that will lend dignity to his work. So that almost sounds like the clothing then qualifies the person. Or maybe they're, maybe they're just kind of, you know, it's uh, same thing looking at it from different sides of the coin. Well, Bitsy, hang, hang on. Right, right. So it's uh and, just his, and, and then it says a perpetual ordinance for him and for his descendants. Right, absolutely. Uh verse forty two and forty three. Uh you know, now all right, I want to stay there for a second because there there is something to the clothing that uh that is important. Um when you compare it y'all don't let me forget this, okay? Hands, ear and feet. Um the it, compared to pagan cultures the priest served naked. In pagan cultures at this time, they, they divested themselves of their clothing to go into whatever the holy place was in, in pagan worship and pagan religion. So you have, I mean, just so knowing that. What was that point? Were they giving up everything? Purity. I'm, you know, I'm completely, you know, it was a symbol of purity in their, in their religions. And uh, but in, in and some of it was sexual in nature. Keep back to what we looked at with pagan worship compared to uh, Judeo-Christian worship. Um, uh, so, uh, but what you have here is you have a. I mean, it's a totally different picture when it comes to worship here uh, with God. And so you do have uh, perpetuity in who who it is. The clothing going to great level, even down to undergarments. The undergarments of the priest, and it gives you description into how long they're supposed to be and what parts of the body they cover. Um, contrast that to pagan understanding of where it's the opposite. You, you rid yourself of clothing for the act of worship, and here you put on all kinds of clothing for the act of worship. Uh, it, you know, it's... Uh, I mean, it, there's there's some rationale behind that. And sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> and your slip, okay. That was pr- all right. We'll trust that. Uh, you know, guys, we don't wear slips, so I'm unfamiliar with that one. Sure, sure. I mean, in the, in the military, they wear different 
Right. Uh, you know, that's a little bit harder to, I mean, the black robe inside of worship today is probably misplaced uh, because that's an academic dress. Uh, the robe, the alb, what I wear that's white, that's more of the clergy dress. But the stole, yeah, we, the only reason why we change is just uh, uh, one, aesthetics. And then uh, the, the reason we wear the alb is the alb is cooler. And so there's a practical reason that John and I wear it. It's just so hot in the black robe. And, uh, but I, I want to say coming out of the late 1800s, early 1900s, you had a, a, a shift in clergy dress to academic, academic robes. And, uh, you know, and you can, go, you can Google up the, what, you know, if it's a poofy sleeve or if it's a tailored sleeve, what's what, some level of, of uh, and the color. You know, um, the, the, the things that, that set the clergy apart in, in actual clergy dress, liturgical dress, uh, is the stole more than anything else. And uh, the stole inside of modern times is the uh, symbol for ordination uh, as an elder. And for deacons, they wear a sash, like the, something that would be like in the beauty pageants, like a, you know, the, the sash that goes around. And, uh, um, you know, uh, and there are others, I mean, belts, you can, they're, they're a little bit more, but mainly it's the stole. Uh, the robe, um, compared to the alb, the alb would be more of the, I mean, that's the, you know, we're. But I think it looks more important. Well, the alb, mm -hmm. well, it's supposed to. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, the idea is not to be, um, the dressing of an alb, um, one was a sign of poverty. So you got to go back to uh, Protestant Reformation, things of that nature. Um, I mean, it, was a, uh, it, it, is, it does look more meager uh, compared to the academic robe. It does. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a monk's dress. We do. And we have a belt. Uh, yeah. Well, so it, but, there are, but there's dress that indicate all kind of things. Um, Um, no, that, a prayer, a prayer shawl. Yeah, they, they have a prayer shawl. Some of them are prayer shawls. Uh, you know, the, the stole, whether or not it, it dates back to Jewish culture, I, I'd have to spend some time. I can't remember that right off the bat. Um, right, right. To me, the, the, um, the, that's more of a covering. And so in, in, uh, Jewish culture coverings when praying, not coverings are important. And uh, so I want to say the stole uh, doesn't go back that way as in its uh, 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 history of it. Um, but uh, it, I mean, it, it, it probably somewhere is linked to the Old Testament. I just have to, I, you know, I should know that being on the board of ministry. Right. But they all had on black robes like academic except for the monsignor. That's right. He he had a, he, he well you know, well but but it's clergy is 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 clergy dress, I mean more so than academic dress. Right. That's right. And uh but yeah, I mean even even you know, there there are magazines that You'd be, well, maybe you wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I was shocked at the, you know, uh, yes. I mean, there, you know, uh, there, there are some, uh, the equivalent of dress albs that I guarantee you there's not a, a female wedding dress that costs more than those regardless <laughs> of where it's at. I mean, it, it is, I mean, you know, you can get to whatever level you want. And... Uh, so, I mean, but the idea was, I mean, that's not its origin. The origin is it's, uh, you know, there's level of poverty. You know, you can think back to priests uh, before split between Protestants and Catholics. I mean, there was, a, the idea was you took a vow, and it was a vow to be, uh, there was a level of being set apart, but not set apart for uh, wealth and things like that. I mean, that's not what happened. I'm just talking about the way, you know, the, the way it was supposed to work. But you have... 
divine um, appointment here. You have dress that either uh, that in some form or fashion goes with that. Um, and you know, in 29 verse 7, uh, I mean, you see that uh, uh, they are appointed um, not so that they can become a, a priest, but so that their function uh, uh, is works in line with the garment. I mean, the garment is indication that this is stuff that belongs to God. And so it's not to be, the, the clothing itself is not, uh, it is of the same level as what the, the tabernacle will be about and built. And, and so this is high function, high job, high responsibility. And so the dress indicates that. Now, there's interesting to me that in the whole ordination process, um, that there's uh, the idea of hands, uh, ear, and feet. Uh, you, have you seen, you remember that passage where uh, when they are uh, ordained, one they have to wash and, uh, and then they put on all the garments, uh, like in verse 29, I mean in chapter 29, uh, they wash themselves first, then they get dressed, and then Moses pours oil on them. What's the significance of oil? Anointing, Anointing that's exactly right. And oil is the, the physical representation inside the Old Testament and, and even in the New Testament of uh, it, it's the oil is the symbol of God's spirit. And so the idea of being anointed with oil. Uh, and then after that takes place, there are sacrifices. And they're supposed to do a few things with the actual, uh, with, with the, the blood. Now they do some things with putting it on the altar some of it is just sprinkled, uh, some of it is poured, but then they also are to, uh, they're to touch their, uh, they're, they're holding it in their hands, so their hands have blood on it, they're to touch their ear, and then their feet have blood on it as well. What, again, is the significance of the ear? At, yeah, I'm just making sure you're all paying attention. So, uh, it's hearing. But what, what is the organ for obedience? Oh, that it's the ear. I hear and I obey. And so there's a reason why they touch the ear. The ear uh, um, is, the, is the part of the body that is linked to the idea of obedience. Um, uh, the feet, you know, obviously the walking, the hands, the serving. Notice that when they're getting ready to ordain the priest, they do these sacrifices for seven days. Is that significant? Well, I mean, obviously seven. Yeah, I mean, you've got a, obviously a whole number, as in a whole biblical wholeness number in seven. Uh, but is there something more than that? How, what's that? Uh, think about if you're Aaron and you're the sons and you, in this moment of ordination, you are going through the same prescription seven days straight before you even take office. Well, um, if you wanted to teach your, let's just use a parental analogy. If you wanted to teach your children that something is very serious and something is very important and you were to follow a certain prescription, uh, what do you do? Repetition. Right? And so, I mean, think about the holy time. And this is, this is in front of the people too, okay? So this is, they're, they're being ordained. They go through all this dress, they, you know, and that's, that's uh, given great prescription to. You got to ask, you're, you're sacrificing all these things. And you do it, you know, not just one time, not just two times or three times or four or five or six. You do it seven. Uh, I mean, that's the significance of you know, what you are about to undertake as priest, this is not something that's light. It's serious. Uh, and so you have this repetition uh, over and over and over and over to emphasize what's going on. Because the moment they are in office, uh, they, they then have to do worship three times a day. Now they have to man the lights as, as um, I forgot someone uh, made, made uh, mention of before the break. But what all, how many sacrifices do they do daily? Three. Morning, noon, and evening. 
And sacrifice in the Old Testament is worship. And so part of the daily routine is they have to, they have to man the fire, okay? That's just, you know, uh, got to keep the flame burning. But then at different times of the day, every day, they're going to be in worship. worship. And now where, where's worship? Is it outside, in, outside the camp? Where's worship? That's exactly right. No, it's in here. Which is what? What is this? What is the tabernacle? It's going to be where the presence of God dwells. And so you can see the significance behind this. This is not something that's just haphazard. Oh yeah, by the way, you know, um, we're going to roll the dice and Shane, you get it on Monday and Ann, you get it on Tuesday and down the road. No, it, it is every day this is what you do. And this pays the rent. I mean, this is, this is what you have to do I mean, as the bottom rung. But it's not bottom rung in its meaning. It's, it's holy worship in front of a holy God. Um, so, Patty, to go back to your analogy about a kingdom of priests or priesthood of believers, and part of our role is to worship, correct? Wouldn't we say that? Uh, do we approach worship the same way? I mean, that's just something to think about. So we asked that first question back in the very beginning. You know, do we, do we tend to the things that are of God's presence the same way? Do we approach then even in the functioning of our life, uh, if you'll grant me, or, or what we do? Uh, and we could look at it as worship, the things that, that take place in the presence of God. Do we devote the same level of seriousness to this, to our, our worship, that is even in the text? That's interesting. And I would imagine that the answer for, for, you know, is maybe, you know, but maybe not. And uh, so one of the things that we're, we're looking at, we're not just want to get knowledge for knowledge's sake, but the prayer that we pray before we start is, God, I want to not just learn, but I want application of what I'm learning. So if it's that serious for the priests, and we are now priests, then why would we not want to, I mean, is it just something that we say, well, that only applied to Aaron, now it doesn't apply to me. Well, I mean, then how do you sit with some of the Roman passages, the book of Romans that says your daily life is what? Worship. That's right. It's an offering. And so, uh, you know, it's, you know, on one level we can make the jumps from, you know, Patty, when, when we were talking uh the, the jumps from Exodus to the New Testament or the jump from Exodus into our, our own life, there's so many things that we gladly welcome. Maybe not this one. I mean, you know, it's, it, it, think about it. I mean, the seriousness of it, uh, the idea that your daily life is worship and does that, I mean, I, I'll be the first to admit, mine pales to this. It's embarrassing. I mean, the idea of, you know, do I even approach worship with this way? Sure, I understand. Um, so I do think you've given us the ability to do that. It's just connection with him brings us closer to him. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Well, do you reverence every, not you specifically, do, do we reverence every moment then that way? Okay, but that's, my point is, Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We live, sure. We live in a body. And right. We have a spirit, so it's always connected with him. That's what's going on. The Holy Spirit that he has given us, he makes intercession. Right. Right. I, I, I'm, I think that's, uh, I mean, I think that's very fair. There, there is a sense of uh, um, we can worship 
anytime, any place. Uh, I mean, that's part of the jump that takes place in the New Testament with us being the the sacred. What what did you say it was? What's your instead of sanctuary, sacred dwell or sacred residence or something, being the sacred residence. Um, but of the things that we can control, all right. Let's I'm gonna use that language um, because you said the challenge of the things that we can control. Inside of that challenge, the question I would want to ask is, do we approach that, uh, whether it be three times a day or whether it be at, at parts of the day, do, do we approach it with the same level of seriousness, dedication, and, and holiness? And so to use the words that were, were given, the challenge, I think that uh, at least I'll speak first person, then I, I would need to continually remind myself that there are things I can control, okay? And so of those things that I can control, do I, do I then submit those or, uh, you know, approach God with those things so that it would look more like what's going on with the seriousness of the Exodus text? That, that's my point. I, I mean, I, I don't think that, I, I'm in agreement. You can, because of the Holy Spirit, you are connected. Uh, I mean, th- there is a new being, to use the term that Paul uses uh, in, in, in the Corinthian letters, where you and God become a new being. And, and I think the best analogy that we have in today's uh, understanding is DNA. All right? Think about what happens when DNA is formed. I mean, it, it becomes, it's linked together. You can't, I mean, you, you know, you, you just, you can't break that stuff up. It's building. It's fundamental. So you, you have new DNA, you and God together. Um, and, but there are some things that we can control that, uh, whether it be either lapse of mind, lapse of judgment, whatever it may be, um, I'm not sure of the things that we uh, that we can control, uh, do we do we bring those before God? Sometimes yes, with a sense of seriousness, uh, with a sense of holiness. But sometimes not. Of the times that are not, I think it's worth looking into why it's a not and not a yes. That's all I'm getting at. And so, uh, and, and if you want to start, I would say start first with. Um, you, you know, with corporate worship, that's easy. You know, if it's three times for, for Aaron, you know, whenever, whenever you're in corporate worship. And, and then, you know, after, after that, move into of those times that you're talking of where, you know, where you could be driving down the road or something and you see something that makes you think of God or, or a scripture or whatever. And then you start having this, this uh, interaction with, with God's spirit. Well, you know, th- then move into those times. Uh, um, and, and if, if for us, say everything lines up well, how can we then help others uh, in, in this type of stuff of what they can control? Uh, because it's serious for God. And it's not serious as if to say, you know, God is standing over in judgment waiting. It's serious for God because what's the whole purpose behind this? I'm in covenant with you. I'm, I'm giving you insight into who I am I want to help you approach me. Remember, that's where all this is for. It's all, all this is for. How can you, as the people, approach me and be in my presence? All right? And so of the things that we can control, you know, do we then approach it in these same levels? Uh, yeah, and I, maybe we do, okay? I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to force any of it on, you know, this is a question that all of us have to answer. And, and sometimes it's going to be easy, I would imagine. Sometimes it's not. And, and when it's not, uh, I think those are the best opportunities to lay before the microscope of God's Spirit and say, why? I mean, for instance, um, I, I was talking to a Sunday school class a couple of Sundays ago, and, and I think it came out of a, a lesson a few weeks ago here. Um, do you know your weakest areas? Like say with temptations. Okay. If not, why? Now, the, probably why not is because it's painful 
and we don't we just would rather not deal with it okay that's that's fine but that that doesn't If we do know where the weakest areas are, I mean, that, that is, that's so valuable because then you can invite God. I mean, that creates a sensitivity to where you know that the light's about to change from green to yellow or maybe even to red. And so those, are, you know, and I think you can make a jump out of the Exodus text with this. God has given prescription to help the people be with them. And so to, to not investigate it or to, to, to dismiss it or whatever, uh, one of the questions that was asked at the break had to do with, you know, the going into the Holy of Holies. And one of the companion pieces to the Day of Atonement comes out of Leviticus chapter 16. You know how that chapter begins? There's, in, there's discussion given to, to Aaron because his sons did not equate the sacrifices with the level of importance that they should have, and they died. And so he give. I mean, go look at it real quick, and we'll, we'll close with that. Um, uh, Leviticus chapter 16, first verse. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. How did they die? Comma. When they drew near before the Lord and died. That's exactly right. Yeah, Leviticus 16, verse 1. Yeah, right. I mean, same thing with Eli's sons. If you get into the judges, same difference. And so my point is, uh, for whatever reason, there was, there, and we're speculating. I mean, we don't know Aaron's sons like we would know Moses and Aaron. But obviously there was something that inside of them, maybe it was pride, Maybe it was laziness. I don't know. I mean, but they did something that definitely put them on the wrong side. Okay? And they got in trouble. All right? And so uh, why not know where the larger weaknesses are, 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 are the weak areas that are still in need of, of regeneration, still in part of that sanctification process? Why not know those? I mean, you know, if... Uh, if you know that with God, we'll just, I'm going to make up like numbers one through seven are not an issue. I mean, those are home cooking for you. Well, fantastic. Give thanks to God. But eight through ten, maybe that's an issue. Okay, then in the growth process, where, where should we spend our time? With one through seven or eight through ten? Eight through ten. And so if, you know, if worship's one of them, then not, why not bring worship under the microscope of God? I want to grow in grace with you. I know I need your help most here. Those, that you can control. And I think that's a lovely question to ask. Not a scary question. It can be scary, yes, because it, you know, God will reveal things about our nature that God wants to transform. It's not that God doesn't want to do these things. Remember, how do you approach me? How do you live in covenant? I'm giving you everything you need. Sure. Hey, right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, in, in prayer, yeah, by far. I mean, well, what, you know, um, Thanksgiving opens up a gate to, to use the Roman, Romans 1 passage, Romans 1 and 2. Thanksgiving opens up a gate uh, of all types of things that lead to, to, to closeness, growth, uh, holiness, all those things. And, you know, but, all right, so let's just say thankfulness is, uh, say thankfulness is a struggle for some, okay? Then, but th that's a great question. Then bring why thankfulness is a struggle before, uh, into God's presence, I mean, why not approach this with the sense that God is waiting on us because God wants to be with us and He's given us all the material that is needed to approach Him. I mean, this, this is not something that God is standing, you know, if you don't get your ticket, you can't get in. I mean, God's already opened the door, has thrown a thousand tickets. I mean, you know, so the idea is, you know, bring who we are 
everything, good, bad, the ugly, the, all that stuff, bring it before him for the purpose. He already knows. I mean, it's not like we're, you know, it's, it's us. It's the things that we can control. Okay? And then we, I mean, this is a beautiful passage, even though it's detailed and it seems like we're just reading prescription. That, see the picture behind the Exodus text. I'm in covenant with you. I want, I'm, I'm going to be in your presence. I desire to be in your presence. I want to help you be in mine. Here's how to approach me. Here are the things that you need. Here are the people that you need, talking about the children of Israel. And, and, and the idea is for them to be in harmony with, with God. And God's doing the work. Uh, same with us. All right, well, that's past time. So uh, I owe y'all now. So uh, um, any, any final questions or comments? Okay, ne- go ahead. Right. Well, I mean, it goes into the uh, the Levites are, are um, they of that tribe? Some are, some aren't. They 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 are helpers in the temple, but they're not. Some of them aren't priests, uh, as the way it it, it unfolds. Um, uh, you know, as for today, I mean, I, I, you know, you don't have, you have so many communities that don't, yeah, I mean, you don't, yeah. So I, I don't think there's same, same levels today. All right. Uh, thank you. And may the Lord bless you. And I hope you have a, a good rest of the week.